Welcome to another episode of Before You Kill Yourself with your host, Leo Flowers. I hope that, I hope that you're doing well. I hope that you are. Uh, and, it, and if you're not doing well, I hope that you are, are letting people know that you're not doing well. You know, I hope that you're reaching out and talking to somebody about it and sharing it or journaling about it. I, you know, yesterday I was struggling in this episode. I talk about how I just been on this eating binge lately where <clears throat> donuts, ice cream, all the things is, it's unlike me. Uh, I mean, not, okay. It's not unlike me. Anybody who knows me knows I get down with some donuts, but, uh, but recently it's just been a change in my, my eating patterns. Um, where I've been skipping dinner and replacing it with with donuts, ice cream, and all all the things, and I was like, "What's going on here?" And it, and I just realized that like I need endorphins. Anybody out there struggling with f- uh, food and and binge eating, and you realize it's it's usually at the same time. Like I'm not waking up wanting donuts. It's always at the same time every day between like uh, noon and three. So something about that is like the witching hour. That there's a book called The Noonday Demon that uh that talks about <clears throat> um how sometimes the depression can hawk you in the middle of the day. So I think I think especially because it's the summertime, there's an extra light going on outside. But anyway, so I was like, all right, what is it that I'm getting from the the food that uh, that I need? And I realize uh it releases endorphins in your body. And and it's it's a hormone, and so I looked up other ways of of naturally releasing those hormones, and uh, and there's a few ways you can get it through music, massage, exercise releases endorphins, um, you know, uh, being outside. Uh, what were the other ones? Uh, making a playlist. You know, if you can't listen to music, making a playlist. There is. Oh my God! Why is why am I having a brain drain? I even put in my calendar, Leo needs endorphins. And I put it in there every day to remind me that I need endorphins. Oh, uh, swimming, dance, that, that goes under exercise. Uh, sex releases endorphins. Uh, chocolate, chili peppers. I'm going to go get, <laughs> I'm going to go get some chocolate today, um, which is crazy. But yeah, that's what I'm going to do. Uh, they have on here drinking wine, but if you're struggling with alcohol, do not let this be a uh, give you. Don't let this give you permission to g- start drinking again. Um, that's why they have a list of things you can do. So pick the ones that are best for you. Right? Um, laughing, laughing releases uh, endorphins. So you know, right now I'm uh, I, I've got this. New app called Fit Radio. Oh, it's not a new app, but there's an app called Fit Radio, and they have these DJs on there. And I and I play the music for my uh, my clients for personal training. But now I'm just listening to it for myself too, because they have great music, and it's like having your own DJ. Um, so if uh, you want to check out Fit Radio, I'm not sponsored by them at all, but um, but they just always have great music, and you know, it's like there's there's no commercials, and a lot of them they'll if even with the hip hop, they will blurt out the uh, the profanity because I'm not a huge fan of all that profanity. Anyway, uh, I'm excited about today's episode. We have uh, author Lucas Wolf on today. That's right. He wrote a book about his life, which I should do. Um, his book is My Perfect Life. How depression almost ended it, and how I found purpose through pain. Um, my boy Lucas, man, this was a great episode. We we really uh, start off, uh, you know, connecting on uh, Penn State. You have to listen uh, in for that. But you know, Lucas, uh, his journey was uh, one where it was fraught with guilt over how he was raised and uh, and how he dealt with that and. Uh, he shared. He shares with us three ways in which he's dealt with his depression, and I thought that they were they were very wonderful. I wrote them down, and I can't wait for you guys to hear how he coped with it and how he dealt with his intrusive thoughts of suicide and uh, panic attacks. And we also talk about um, how to be kind 
and firm with yourself, which is I oh, that that balance of I it's either like I'm either beating myself up, complete self flagellation, or I'm just uh you know completely coddling myself. And and to find that space in the middle is is such a, a challenge. And so, uh, but Lucas shares with us how to be kind and firm at the same time. Where is that? Where is that sweet spot right there? Uh, so, in the meantime, you can also go to thrivewithleo.com for one on one coaching with yours truly. Let's get to tomorrow together. And with that said, let's jump into the episode. Lucas. Hey, Leo. What's going on, brother? Hey, not too much. How you doing? Uh, you know, eating way too many grapes as usual. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure you got a lot of those over in California, right? Yeah, where are you at, Lucas? I'm actually East Coast. I'm in uh, New Jersey. The Garden State. Yes, sir. Now, are you in a garden part or are you in a not-so-garden part? Uh, I guess I'm in the not so garden part. I'm, uh, I live, uh, in Lawrenceville. It's about, uh, maybe about 20 minutes outside of Princeton area. Oh, I didn't realize Princeton was in, uh, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. Wait, yep. the way the name drop. Did you go to Princeton? Lewis? No, no, I did not. I went to, uh, I went to Penn state actually. Whoa. I almost went to Penn state. Oh, yeah, did you really? Yeah, I, so, you know, I played, uh, I mean, you probably don't know. I played college football, and and Penn State was the first school to uh, recruit me. They were the first school to send me a letter of of, of interest to play there. Um, wow. And, That's incredible. Well, and the incredible part was uh, that letter saved my life. I was I was brought up on carjacking charges at the time um i couldn't prove my innocence like i, I couldn't prove that I, I didn't do it that i wasn't there at the time so uh they're gonna sentence me and then because i got that letter the day before my court date and showed it to the judge i was like listen i'm gonna go to penn state and play football he was like all right i'll just give you community service over the summer he goes but if i see you back in here again kid it's a wrap <laughs> Uh, so I'm very grateful to Penn State, even though I'd never been there. Saved my life. What'd you major I'm in at Penn State? I actually, I majored in chemical engineering. I don't even know what that is. It sounds like you like, <laughs> it sounds like you're just like in a lab mixing up stuff, like some breaking bad stuff, you know, like there's some explosions. It was, uh, it was definitely pretty painful. Yeah. It had to do with a lot of, uh. I mean, you learn a lot of manufacturing things, thermodynamics, stuff like that. I don't know. It, 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 it uh, I don't regret doing it, but um, it was hard. <laughs> so I'll, I'll say that much. It was, uh, it was definitely, it was definitely difficult. Um, but uh, yeah, that's that's. Uh, yeah. So what made I you go into, into it? I mean, you clearly couldn't have gone into chemical engineering thinking it was going to be a breeze. What made you no. what made you get into it? Um so I, I, I did I wanted something difficult because I was kinda lazy in high school, um and I had a lot of good opportunity and uh I, I, I felt like I really didn't just live up to the potential. Um I also knew that I was inclined to get myself into trouble if I had too much free time on my hands. So I wanted to do something that was going to be difficult that that wouldn't allow for that and i also wanted to do something that i that i didn't think that i could teach myself um and, and i had always had an interest in in chemistry and engineering type stuff and uh it it just kind of fit and i found my way there wow those are some really great reasons to major in engineering uh yeah. i you know that you know if i had talked to you and when I was in, because I was a pre-med major, and I was like, this is way too easy. I may have stayed a pre-med major because I don't do well when I have too much time on my hands. And I, I was a psych major, and that gave me way more time on my hands than uh, what I needed. Not that it wasn't challenging, but it, it wasn't enough to keep me occupied 
uh, long enough. And, uh, and psychology is something I felt like I definitely could have uh, taught myself. Um, but, you know, the pre-med stuff, not so much. So, so hats off yeah. to you, man. I, I appreciate that. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you. Your, so is, uh, uh, is psychology what you ended up doing? Um, well, I'm, you know, t- what's fascinating is that y- 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 when you get out of college and into the real world, you start to learn that it's all psychology. I, I, you know, it, it, when they say life is 90% mental, it, it's, it, it's true because whether you are uh, a cashier at, you know, Walgreens or... Uh, a psychologist or an athlete or, uh, you know, chemical engineer, like a lot of it's psychology in terms of how do you manage your mental health so that you can perform optimally, right? And because we're talking about sleep, we're talking about uh, social intelligence, uh, managing emotions, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so yeah. you realize that psychology uh, – permeates all areas of life where you're talking about your relationships, you know, your girlfriend, wife, your children, uh, all these things uh, require some, some level of psychology. So uh, yeah, I'm always using it. this podcast, you know, and then also uh, do coaching um, and, and personal training. Like it's even with the stand up comedy in order to really, um, to do the comedy that I want to do uh, and to provide the insights I want to provide requires a level of, uh, of empathy, of compassion, of understanding people and, 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 and what motivates uh, human behavior. So, yeah, it's, it's always – I mean, just yesterday I ate <laughs> um, four cupcakes and I had a, 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 a Carl's Jr. burger with fries and a milkshake, which I haven't had in – uh, months like five six months and i just like went on this food bender and so immediately i was like all right what, what psychologically is going on what's going on with my hormones what do i really need and so then i was like oh okay i just need endorphins and i have to figure out a healthier way to get endorphin you know like i'm, I'm constantly tweaking alternating i'm a i'm a, I'm a leo engineer right <laughs> no that's that's super cool no that is that that is really cool and and just trying to figure out like why you do certain things you know why, why you have cravings for this or that or the other thing. That's, that, that's some neat stuff. The, you know, you, so Lucas, you have this book, my perfect life, how depression almost ended it and how I found purpose through pain. Talk, talk to me about this book. How, what, why was it perfect out there in New Jersey for you? Yeah. So I, uh, um, you know, I, I, I grew up well. Um, I had a, I had a good close family, um, you know, we, we did stuff together. We went on vacations together. We ate dinner together, uh, at the table with the TV off. Uh, you know, we did holidays. I, I had a very good home, a very good family. I had a good education. Uh, I had a, a group of friends, you know, I, we were all close. Uh, I had opportunity. I, I played a lot of sports. I was pretty decent at most of them and I, I never really had anything that I had to worry about you know I never had to worry about money I never had to worry about where my next meal was going to come from I you know it was, a, it was a good comfortable life I, I think it's the kind of life that we would all want to provide for our kids um, so when I started I- experiencing you know symptoms of depression in, in high school um, which I had I had no idea that that's what it was. I I had no idea what it was. I just figured it was something to do with me being a teenager. You know, everyone says that um, that teenage years are, are kind of weird. And I assumed it just had something to do with that. And I always just tried to push through it and, and make excuses for it because I, I didn't think that I had any right to feel in any way depressed. Um, I felt that my life was too good for that. Uh, and that I hadn't really earned the right to be depressed um, because there's people all over the place that really struggle and that go through, you know, true tragedy. And I hadn't experienced any of that. 
Um, and, uh, you know, over the course of a, a couple of years through high school and through college and eventually breaking down and getting to the point where I realized I'm not going to live if I don't get help. Like, that's it. Um, I started to meet and hear about and read about more and more people that were like me, these these young adults that lived perfect lives, you know, good family, good friends, good grades, good opportunity. And all of a sudden they were just gone. No real symptoms or signs shown at the time. And it was one of those things that, you know, looking back and picking up the pieces, you could kind of see where it had gone wrong, but it wasn't obvious until it was over. Um, and, as I started to realize that this was more and more the case really across the country, I, I, one, I had some relief that, okay, I'm not completely insane. Um, you know, I'm not the only person this has happened to. And two, how, how can I help these people that are just like me, who maybe are silent about what they're going through because like me, they didn't think that they had the right. They, they didn't think that they earned the right to struggle because their life was easy by comparison to, you know, to what others go through. Um, and that's sort of where the idea for my perfect life came from. So you, uh, it's, it's, I want to dig more into the details of your, of your childhood uh, in terms of your family, you're going on vacations, you're having dinner together. Uh, are there other siblings involved? Is, are you the oldest, the youngest? What's happening? Yeah, so I um, I have a twin brother, Joe, and then I have a younger brother, Gabriel. Um, and my younger brother, Gabriel, was actually born healthy, but at 11 months old, he developed pneumococcal meningitis, and he is uh, physically and mentally disabled. Um and he has recovered far more than what the doctors ever thought he could. Um, and I have pretty vivid memories of his recovery growing up um, and just, uh, you know, kind of being a part of that. Um, but the weird thing is, is it never seemed not normal to me to have a have a disabled brother and have a twin brother. Um, I never was really aware until I got older. Um, I guess how unique that is. Yeah, that's unique. I mean, first of all, having a twin, I, I, you know, we always talk about like not comparing yourself to other people. And my sister is four years younger than me. And even though there's a four year age difference and a, a gender difference, uh, my mom was always comparing uh, my sister to me. She was like, why can't you be more like your brother? And, you know, that kind of created this, you know, my sister, uh, you know, always felt like she had to live up to me, but I also felt like I have to live up to this, uh, I, this ideal brother uh, persona um, at all times. So it created that kind of thing. So I can't imagine if right. I had a twin, like the, what kind of comparison that would kind of draw. Like, you know, I can hear, I can just in my mind, imagine people going, you're this twin and he's that twin. It's always like the cool twin and the nerdy twin or the, the party yeah. twin and the book twin. Like how did they, how did people break you two down? So there, I mean, there was definitely a lot of other people doing that to, to us. Um, and I mean, it depended who, who we were with. I mean, I, I was definitely a little more, uh, you know, my, my, my twin Joe, he, he, was a bit more uptight than I was, um, and a bit more studious. Uh, we got about the same kinds of grades, but, um, uh, you know, we were just a little bit different. Um, but we, we, we got along very well. And, uh, my family, you know, especially my parents, uh, my parents were extremely vigilant about us being our own people. Um, and, you know, we, had different abilities and we didn't compete with each other. Um, and they really tried to keep us from, from going down that road. Um, and so, you know, we had like, I mean, we had normal sibling rivalry and, you know, we were best friends, but we also 
butt heads like none other the way that brothers always can. Um, but uh, I think things have always been good with us. Um, and we're very close now. Uh, did he play sports also? Were you guys competitive athletically? Yeah, yeah. So we 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 played all the same sports. Uh, um, soccer was our main one for a while, uh, and he might argue, but I would say I, I I edged him out a little bit in soccer. I was a tiny bit better at him, but then we switched to uh, running. Uh, did cross country and track. And he, he could smoke me in a long distance race. If it was, uh, if it was cross country or the two mile on the track, he, he, he could, uh, he could take me to the cleaners. But if it was like a mile or the 800, uh, I, I was a little, I was a little better at those. I, I could go fast for quick bursts and then I would, uh, kind of lose steam. Um, but he was better at distance stuff. Right on. And and so, like, I would imagine having a, a younger brother that has meningitis. You said he, he recovered further than a th- the doctors thought he would. Like, to what extent? And, and what exactly are the symptoms of, of meningitis? I would imagine maybe he was, like, more wheelchair-bound. Yeah, so it was a, so it's a bacterial infection at, that left him with, um, irre, you know, irreversible brain damage. Um, so he will technically not um he will technically not mature past the level of about a six seven year old um but the doctors you know he had vision problems he had motor control problems you know they didn't think he was ever going to be able to eat by himself um they didn't think he'd be independent in any way whatsoever um you know they 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 really didn't have a lot of hope for him to even live so uh he came out of a coma. I mean, he had all kinds of therapy, but he got vision back in both his eyes. He has, you know, um, he has motor control with both his hands, took a lot of physical therapy to, to accomplish that took a lot of physical therapy for him to be able to stand and walk and do things. He was wheelchair bound for, um, a while. Uh, and I have a pretty vivid memory of him standing for the first time. Um, but yeah, he can do a lot now. Uh, he, he loves playing tennis, racket, baseball. Um, he, he, he loves swimming. That's his favorite. Uh, cause it's a little bit easier for him to move around, um, you know, with the buoyancy of the water. Um, when he was younger, he, he would do a little bit of horseback riding, uh, does bike rides, walks on the treadmill in the morning. So, um, and he, he's learned, so he's, he's deaf, uh, but he's learned sign language, Um, and he can communicate pretty well. He's actually, um, for all of his disabilities, he's actually extremely intelligent. Uh, he knows how to make up signs to explain to you what he wants. And he can see when you don't understand what he's saying and will adjust his made up signs accordingly until you figure it out. Um, so he does some pretty incredible things sometimes, that uh that he definitely was not supposed to do per you know the diagnosis all right so you have a twin brother and you also have a a younger brother who's exceeding beyond uh medical explanations and or expectations i would imagine (laughs) on some level that that would put a pressure on you to to do more. And like you said, you, you grew up in a well-to-do household. So not only do you not have an excuse to um, voice your pain um, or, or whatever your struggles are, but now you also have a younger brother who is, you know, seemingly progressing without complaint also. So you have all these things that are saying to you that uh, you know, your pain and your burden uh, doesn't really matter and, and shouldn't matter because you, you, you have all these things. Is that, yeah, is that I, kind of like what, what you kind of felt like on some level? Yeah, I, I, I definitely, I definitely did that to myself um, for a while when I was younger. Um, it, it was pretty much along the lines of what you said. You know, I, I looked at what was around me and I thought, 
well, I have no right to complain. And whatever I'm feeling logically just doesn't make any sense. Um, and I really didn't know anything about it. I mean, it, it, it made no sense to me why at 17 years old, I was having, you know, intrusive thoughts of suicide when my life was great. Um, and, and, and I also, I, I, I was afraid that I was crazy, um, because I, I, I really didn't know. Um, I, I didn't know that that was normal for someone struggling with depression. And I didn't know that you could struggle with depression absent a tragedy. Um, and so I just, you know, I just didn't want to talk about that. Before we get into the intrusive thoughts on suicide, what uh, d- does your did your parents do for work? Oh, for work. Um, so my dad, uh, my dad is a mechanical engineer. He also went to Penn State, um, and he works with uh, he works uh, for for the government. He's a civilian worker for the Navy. Um, works on uh, aircraft carriers mostly now. Um, and my mom was uh, it's called a C print captionist where she uh, she would go to school and she would um, basically go, she would be paired with a deaf student and she would go to classes with them and would type the notes that the teacher was saying and then would send all those notes um, at the end of the day to the student. Um, and that's sort of a program so that uh, deaf students um, can be in regular classes and still participate. Um, and so she did that until Gabriel aged out of the public school system at 21, um, which was about five years ago. Wow. All right. So, uh, I mean, for me, I guess what I'm doing is I'm trying to piece together all these different pieces of of what you know can contribute to feelings of depression, of feeling like a burden, feeling isolated, and uh, or, you know, just adding pressure onto your plate and, you know, your father being a, uh, you know, a mechanical engineer in the Navy, I, I would imagine a guy like that is not expressing a lot of emotions. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I can't say my dad is the most emotionally expressive person. Um, no, but he's not close to it. He's not close to it either. Um and so I'll, you know, I, I definitely have to give him credit there. You know, it's, it's not like I ever tried to talk to him about something and he told me, oh, you know, that's, that's stupid. You just have to get over it or that's not a real issue. Um, because when I did go to my parents and I said I was struggling, they took it very seriously and nobody thought it was stupid. Um, and they're very good about, you know, talking with me about it. Um, but yeah, he, you know, he's not the most emotional person. No. Yeah. So what, what did you guys talk about at the dinner table? All those nights without the TV on what, what was, what was it like, you know, what'd you learn in school today? Or, you know, was your mom talking about, you know, the, the students that she worked with? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so we would talk about that stuff. We, you know, we would talk about, um, you know, we would talk about life. We, we would talk about religion and, and, and God and, uh, we would talk about, you know, the right way to treat people. Um, we talk about politics sometimes. Uh, we, we talked about, we talked about everything. Um, you know, it, and it wasn't always, it wasn't always that kind of stuff either. Sometimes it would just be, you know, what'd you do today? You know, what you read in a book, what's it about? Do you like the book? Um, you know, uh, you know, what, what, what's your favorite subject in school? Why is that your favorite subject? You know, uh, how are your friends doing? It, it, so all, all kinds of things, you know, they, they, they were, um, in inqui- they were inquisitive without being meddling. Um, you know, they, they took an interest. Um, and I would say what they really did was they tried to guide us in the right direction and also give us the freedom to make choices along the way. So, you know, they weren't tyrants, but they didn't set up no borders either. You know, um, they, they 
gave us general guidelines and a path and then, you know, gave us freedom to decide things, um, which, you know, now, now that I'm 27 years old, almost 28, I, I have to give them a lot of credit for, uh, you know, the way that they, they raised me and my brothers. Cause, uh, I can't imagine it was easy. Yeah. Three boys, you know, that, that's a rambunctious, uh, rambunctious or ram i think rambunctious household right there the yeah <clears throat> what was i gonna say i completely i completely spaced what i was gonna ask you uh but <laughs> anyway so happened. you're you're 17 and you are ex- experiencing these intrusive suicidal thoughts what are the thoughts around it like is it i'm a burden like what do, what do you what, what are the thoughts that are accompanying that it it was definitely that I was a burden. Um, it was also that I was not good enough. Um, like I said, I was uh, I was a little bit lazy in high school. I mean, it, and, and, and you wouldn't know it from anybody else's reactions. I mean, my 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 parents were proud of what I did in high school, and and I got good grades. Um, I think it was just I knew that I could take it to another level, and. I, I had no concept of moderation. Uh, I, I did not understand how to moderate. So it was either, you know, the effort that I put into something was a hundred percent. And by a hundred percent, I mean, it had to leave me nearly dead or it wasn't good enough. Um, and it's hard to do that. So I, I really set myself up. Um, I, I, I put myself in the kind of mind frame where no matter what I did, I lost and I was this, this burden and this loser and this person that didn't deserve the good life that I had. Um, and, and so I think that was a, a really major component of it was guilt. Um, I really felt guilty about how good my life was. And I did not think that I had, uh, you know, I recognized that, I didn't do anything different than anyone else. I was just born and I had these things and other people didn't. And I started to really struggle with how to deal with that in high school. Um, and it felt like such a ridiculous problem, like, like such a first world problem that I did not feel comfortable saying it to anyone. Um, and so I just tried to bury it and, uh, sort of overcome it with achievement. Um, and that didn't work. <laughs> it, it did not work. So what was your grad, what was your GPA when you graduated from high school, Mr. Lazy, not good enough? I, I forget exactly what it was, but it was, it was over a four L because we had honors classes and AP classes. And it was like an A in an honors class was a four or five and, a A in an AP class was a 5.0. And I took like all AP classes in my junior and senior year. Um, I had a bunch of credits going into college. So I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was, it was probably somewhere around a four, two, four, three. And so for the listeners out there, cause I know I have listeners in Thailand and uh, uh, Ireland and uh, Asia and, and throughout parts of the world. Uh, you know, uh, uh, AP courses are the, uh, what does AP stand for? That, that, that lets you know what my GPA was in high school. Uh, I, I think, I think it's advanced placement. Uh, yeah. Advanced placement. It, so basically yeah. Lucas was really smart. Like the, the, the cap is 4.0 and you only get above a 4.0 if you've taken AP courses as, uh, Lucas has stated. So, and I want to highlight this because we, when we are experiencing symptoms of depression and and we are uh you know struggling with suicidal uh ideations it really is a testament to how distorted our thinking becomes to how myopic it becomes to how diminutive it becomes because you know here lucas is sharing that he had not just a 4.0 which is a perfect gpa uh, uh, by all standards, but it's an above a 4.0 and still feeling uh, like he's not good enough, feeling like he's lazy, 
um, and, you know, and, and feeling guilty about all these things because it, you feel like there's an extra gear uh, in there that you you haven't tapped into. And, and Lucas, I also feel like part of what contributes to that is the American mindset of, like, no pain, no gain, right? And, and it's like if we're not, like you said, like, it, you were either 100% all in or, you know, you're not touching it at all. Like, it's either zero or 100 uh, with you. And we have this idea that we have to be 100% in on everything. You know, I was just watching this documentary called, uh, it was a master class of uh, this guy, he's a gangster gardener. And he was talking about when you are plucking leaves from a plant, you only want to pluck a, a third, uh, or from a herb. You only want to pluck a third of the leaves from the herb or else you will uh, kill it. You'll put it in a shock and it'll die. And the, the, I bring that up to say that if we pluck uh, more than a third of our energy for something, we can, we can, uh, we can trigger um, uh, overwhelm and, and, uh, and uh, burnout. In those situations, so this idea of giving a hundred percent for everything is not sustainable. Obviously, one and and two. Shit. Lucas. Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. I, I got I got like a little beat beat. Um. So I appreciate you. I appreciate you, Lucas, sharing you know that that uh, detail with us because I just really want to highlight why cognitive behavioral thinking has been uh, uh, shown to be so effective in treating suicidal ideations. Because really, we are talking about getting in there and unpacking how we think and 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 perceive the world and our life. Uh, uh, in it um so thank you for sharing that that lucas yeah absolutely so after you you know after high school you go to college and and uh, and so it sounds to me like a part of you wanted to uh also show your you know make your dad proud because you went into the same field that he went into and it also sounds like it was kind of a punishment for you of like, I'm lazy, I got to, you know, I got to do something that's going to whip me into shape. So you pick, you know, one of the hardest, um, you know, majors to go into. Yeah, you know, it's, um, it, it was pretty much exactly that. Um, and I even say that in, uh, in my book that I realized that uh, there were kind of, a, a, you know, there were a few reasons that I went into it, but two big things was, um, a desire to do the right thing and really a, a, a punishment that I thought that I deserved. Um, and, uh, yeah. And that, and that, that was why, you know, when I started to realize, like, I, I hate this stuff, <laughs> I, you know, I don't like it and it's, 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 you know, it's killing me doing this. Um, I wouldn't stop because I, I just thought if I can, in my mind, it was like, if I 